What's happening, listeners? This is your man, Dame DNYDC, host of the Two Mics Up podcast. And we are back again today with another amazing episode. Um, you know, we had a lot of uh, men and women, you know, reach out to want to join us on the podcast. And today's guest, for me, is looking at uh, the things that this man is doing. It's a real inspiration in the community. And I wanted to take some time to make sure we uh, got him on the podcast. And uh, I'm just excited, you know, to, to go ahead and let this brother share his his information, you know. Uh, but before we do that, you know, I want to go ahead and pass it to my my co-host, the queen of the show. See what's going on with you, Lisa. What's happening, sis? <laughs> Ain't nothing, bro. It's been a long... This last week has been a long month, bro. What? <laughs> you ain't never lied. You ain't never lied. So How you about that? It <laughs> Yo, same here. You know, uh, just going through everything, you know, being downtown when that whole insurrection took place, man. And when I got the call in the building, talking about evacuate the building, I was like, yo, somebody going to get speed bump out here. <laughs> car, man. Just, uh, I'm not waiting, you know, but. Yeah. I was, I was pretty uh, concerned about you on that day because I know you work like right on the corner. Yo, so I'm, I'm literally down the block. You know, you come out the building, you turn right, you looking right down the block. And um, just watching all the Trump supporters and everything moving around downtown. I mean, it was it was like being in a war zone, you know, like being in Iraq. Um, but like I said, you know, thankfully, you know, I was able to get home safely. You know, took the scenic route, had to go through Maryland because coming through downtown. <laughs> Was not happening, <laughs> you know, but <laughs> made it home safely, you know. Oh, that's and, um, good. Yeah. So that's today, we're going to rock out with, with uh, an amazing guest, you know, Gary Holland. You know, he is, you know, this man is a man of many titles. It's a man of many, many passions and many desires. And I'm before, I'm not even going to introduce all of this, but I'm going to allow Gary to go ahead and jump in. Gary, please take a few moments to introduce yourself to our family and to our listeners, let them know who you are and what you are all about, my brother. All right, thank you, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to spend a few minutes with uh, with you all uh, on the show. This is uh, this is awesome. What you're doing is amazing. What you're providing to the community is amazing. And uh, always in, in, in our prayers, and I'm wishing you great, great, great success as you spread across the nation and, and hopefully across the world with what you're doing. You're doing a great job. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, this Gary, I'm from Alexandria, Virginia, married to Jeanette. Uh, we've been married 26 years. She's from Louisiana. We've raised five kids. I've uh, been in the Northern Virginia area. Our entire relationship, my family's from the DMV. So I'm a true go-go head, you know? Uh, so if anybody is listening in doesn't appreciate go-go, uh, you can go ahead and disconnect now. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I'm from the area, uh, been in IT, 25-year uh, IT career and uh, serve in the ministry. I'm the associate pastor at our church in Dumfries, Virginia, Word of Faith, and have been in the ministry for uh, over 25 years as well, doing a whole lot of things in the ministry along with my wife. And uh, lately, the last several years, I found myself doing a lot more in the community. I've always wanted to serve in the community, I've always served in the community, and uh, because of a lot of the things that have happened around the nation, and, and even locally, the last couple of years, I found myself being more involved here uh, in the Stafford, Fredericksburg, Spotsy uh, region, and uh, established a group, uh, not a group called Enough, uh, which is a, uh, a nonprofit organization focused across a number of areas. We'll talk about it, and it's expanding uh, dramatically. And now we've extended out into uh, St. Louis, we've extended down into the Carolinas, and there's some work now going on down in the Petersburg, Virginia area. So folks just want to work with others to address the needs in our community, and that's really what what I'm all about. Uh, what my wife is all about, and uh, that's kind of how we're focused right now. So that's a little bit about me. Right now, that's amazing stuff, um, and just learning and just hearing that. So I didn't realize or even really know that enough had expanded or is is expanding. Yeah. You know, can you share a little bit more though about you know what enough really is doing here yeah. in our backyard here in the in the Northern Virginia area? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it, it, there are a lot of things going on, and and uh, the group and the board members, myself, we're a lot. We operate a lot behind the scenes. You know, it's not about us having the mic. It's not about us being in the newspaper. Um, but we we focus on several different initiatives. Uh, one initiative is civic is um voter literacy and civic engagement. And there's a young lady locally uh, that leads that initiative, and she knows everybody politically. And I won't drop her name, but Lisa knows who I'm talking about. She knows my everybody. cousin. Okay. My, okay. Kim 
That's your family. You put that's my right. name out. All right, Kim. that's Kim. That's Amazing. Kim. That's right. Kim <laughs> is awesome, and she leads that initiative, and she helps us to connect our community with elected officials locally at the state level. Uh, she helps us to set up meet and greets with people virtually. Jennifer Carroll Foy, all the way down to people running for board of supervisors, law enforcement, etc. So we focus a lot on that and on educating adults and children about the good local government and who does what and why it's important to vote for the sheriff to vote for board of directors so that initiative focuses on educating people in that area and it's amazing when you come to find out how much how little we know how little our people know about what's going on and how little we know about the impact we can't have when we get engaged civically we also have an initiative around economic development and we're tied into what's going on in stafford uh, at the EDA level with the new downtown Stafford initiative, with the new smart cities initiative. And we're pressing to make sure that uh, businesses of color have an opportunity to bid on some of these new contracts that are gonna be coming out. I mean, million dollar, multi-million dollar contracts. Usually we don't know about those until they've already been uh, given to somebody's brother or cousin and we find out too late, but we're there now. I mean, they realized during these meetings uh, there's a company they contracted called Riot out of North Carolina to help Stafford de develop their strategy. And when I've been on these meetings because they are open and they realize that I work in enterprise architecture, I understand cloud computing technologies and I understand all of this. It, several meetings early on, they had to pause because they realized that when I'm asking questions, I know what I'm talking about and I'm demanding that we have an opportunity to have to be part of these planning discussion. So economic development is important and I'm actually leading that initiative and I'm leading it from the perspective of getting us plugged in to what's going on in Stafford initially so that our businesses can participate, not just on storefronts, but be involved in the actual pursuing of contracts that drive the, uh, the infrastructure development in Stafford. We also have a criminal justice initiative that's focusing on a number of things, working with the Spotsy NAACP on some issues at Rappahannock Jail, establishing relationships with law enforcement in Stafford and Spotsy and Fredericksburg, making sure that we have town halls with them. We've had a number of town halls with law enforcement and the community so folks can talk to them, express their grievances, their feelings in a way that's non-threatening where law enforcement hears it. And I, you can talk to a lot of the people that have been there. They've benefited immensely from that. We've connected law enforcement with the local uh, alumni chapter of the Kappas in Fredericksburg and had them address the God Right group of young men, just talking to them about pulling people, pulling police over, how to act, how to respond. We're really working uh, within criminal justice reform to connect with the young people, to connect with the community. And now we're working with organizations like Virginia Cares and other organizations to help with the recidivism issue. So when people come out, they have a net to catch them, to help them not only get a job and somewhere to stay, but to learn some skills that can sustain them so they don't find their way back in. So we're doing some of that work. And it's really about collaboration. You know, our goal really is, is advocacy, collaboration, and transformation. And we also have initiatives in community service. Uh, we have one called Mind, Body, and Soul that's focused on just coming together, going for walks, uh, meditating or mindfulness, reading a book, things where we need to just kind of exhale and stop worrying about the fight all the time and just yep. get some peace, right? We have yep. an initiative around that as well. So we're doing a lot of things in the area, connected with a lot of folks, and we're now beginning to multiply that out across different regions as well. So I hope our listeners really took a moment to really listen to all of these great things that, you know, enough is, is involved with in our community. And one, like I said, in doing the research and really diving in, this is one of the things that I was inspired by. This is what we need. And it, it really knows with our platform here of educating, empowering, and impacting community. These are the type of things that we want to really use our platform to highlight. And it's just great to hear that you're, you're really based here in our backyard, but now again, you're expanding and you're really doing what we're trying to do, connect our communities brick by brick, block by block, county by county, state by state. And that's how we really grow as one. So, you know, uh, kudos to you and everything that you're doing with Enough and everything that you're doing in the community is really appreciated. All right. I mean, that's what, there's two things that come to mind a lot. People ask me, you know, why do you, you know, what inspires you, you know, to, to, to do some of the things you do? You know, my number one inspiration absolutely is my wife, Jeanette, uh, again, married 26 years. She's that person that holds me accountable, that challenges me. She's my uh, BS meter. There's no reason for me to ever try to front on anybody because if she finds out, 
she will bust me straight out in front of everybody. <laughs> so she holds me accountable and keeps me honest and she pushes me and challenges me and she inspires me. And then when folks say, well, what inspires you to serve in the community? I often say two things come to mind from the Bible, right? I am a, a minister, but there are a couple of scriptures that I always think about. One is that to whom much is given, much is required. You know, I've been blessed tremendously professionally. Um, I don't have a college degree. I'm actually going back to school soon, um, but I've been blessed professionally. And I now manage a group, a global group of software architects for a large software company. Okay. And I know it's all because I've been blessed and God has given this to me. And he's given me so much, you know, how dare I not give back to people that right. stand in the need. And then the other thing that comes to mind is um, we have to work while it's day because night comes when no man right. can work. So I'm not trying to sit on, lay on my, on my couch with my feet up when there's things out here to be done, right? So that, oh, those are my two points of inspiration for getting involved in the uh, in the community. So how do you uh, how do you uh, balance all of these things that all of your passion, your efforts, everything that you have going on? Because you have a lot going on. I mean, you're everywhere. You and my cousin Kim is <laughs> everywhere. Every time you turn around. So how do you get that balance? How do you balance out um, all that, you, that you're doing? Yeah, two, two things. The number one is my wife, because if I'm ever out of balance, she's the one that calls me out and says, okay, that's enough. Don't, mm -hmm. you're not going to any more meetings. You're not going to this event, that event, you're staying home or what have you. Mm -hmm. She helps me to maintain that balance. And when I get off kilter a little bit, she's the one that pulls me back into alignment. And also just really simply, I've been fortunate to work from home for uh, probably 20 years now. I've been home office based, but the company I'm with or the companies I've been with where I work from home and I've traveled a lot, but I'm always at home. Um, so my schedule has been very, very flexible. Um, and mm -hmm. I've been real fortunate to have that. My wife has also been home office based for about 10, 15 years. She's a developer by trade. So mm -hmm. she works, to, she's in her computer and she's in her corner. I'm in my corner. Uh, and when we have breaks, we come back together. But the flexibility of the type of job I have, uh, Lisa, is really what gives me the, the ability to, to juggle a lot of different things and to manage a lot of different things. One thing I laugh about is our children were all athletes. And I would be in meetings and practices and on 95, driving them everywhere. And nobody knew I wasn't at home. But I thank God for cell phones and WebEx and, <laughs> and WhatsApp and all of that. But I th I'm thankful that I had the flexibility with my career uh, to be as flexible as I am. And I do believe it's, this is all part of the plan for me. So I'm just going to take advantage of it while I can. Good job. Great. Yeah. Well, you know, to piggyback on that, and this is kind of like a two-part uh, question. You know, so you mentioned, you know, you, you play a role in the church. And so I, I just have a question, really, like, in your opinion, if you could, like, what is the role now of the, the church in the Black community? That's a, you know, that's a problem. That's a problem. Last year, um, when a lot of the things were happening, when Mr. Floyd lost his life, Breonna Taylor, and the marches were happening, and a lot of the uh, rallies were happening, a lot of folks were asking, you know, where's the church? Where's my pastor? Right, What's the right. voice of the church right now? I want to talk to somebody, but my pastors are silent or they're not present, mm -hmm. right? And that actually spawned me uh, to start. But actually, in, now is another group that I'm part of. Um, called Undivided. And Undivided is a group of pastors from the Fredericksburg, Spotsy, Stafford area that come together weekly on Thursdays. There's an article in the uh, Freelance Star, came out last night. Taz Coghill wrote it about Undivided. But the goal is to deal with the issue of racial reconciliation in the church. So one thing I, I was led to do was pull pastors together of different races, denominations, et cetera, different political ideologies. They're conservatives, liberals, whatever. But we come together in a safe space to just to talk and to be honest. And we're learning from each other. Mm -hmm. And it really is helping. The number one, I think that will help churches to begin to understand how to minister to their congregations and be more vocal to their congregations and to give people a place to vent and to talk and to find some of the comfort that they need right now. Because we need a lot of healing, yeah. you know, right now. And the church is the place, I believe, to right. provide that. So that's one thing. Also, there's a group called 540 Pastors, and these are primarily black pastors. And I established that a couple of years ago to try to get them to come together quarterly just to have lunch, just to talk, to get to know each other and collaborate. So when it's time for us to work together, we can move together as one. It's tough to do with a lot of churches. And that's why I think now a lot of folks are saying, where is the church still? What is the role of the church? The role of the church in any community, I believe, is to be there, for, be that place for healing. 
to be that place where a person can go to, whether they're conservative, liberal, black, white, Asian, gay, straight, whatever it is, but they can go somewhere for healing and know somebody will listen to them and will respond to them in love and respond to them in a, in a supportive way. And I don't think we've done a good job of that because we've hid behind wanting to offend a portion of the congregation right. and cause people to leave churches and things like that. But I think we're getting there uh, as we continue to work together and as we continue to realize that if we don't minister to people and help people, somebody will. Yeah. And that somebody right. may be the wrong somebody and it may result in somebody making bad decisions. So I think we're going in the right direction, but it's going to take time and it's going to take people becoming humble and realizing it's not about our church or our brand or our organization, it's about the people. And I think we're getting there. And I don't have any problem being in groups with pastors saying this, mm -hmm. and I've had a lot of them mad at me because of it. <laughs> no, no, right, because it feels like the church lost its foothold in the community. I mean, you know, um, growing up, the church was the uh, foundation of yeah. the community right you knew the community you knew um everyone every uh, the meeting place was the church the social outlet was the church and even um with social injustice because we were at the church it was where we congregated so it feels like the church is um so it has lost a foothold on the um, foundation of the community mm -hmm. and it's gone astray to somewhere like in between commercial and well I mean, it, it, you know my not, mouth is reckless no so you no, no but I, I think you want you wanted something only be, only because I agree with you and the reason why the premise of that question was because I find that social media in some ways has removed that portion of the church because a lot of people don't really congregate at the church as much anymore. We congregate through social media. And I, that's really what drew my question. I wanted to hear from someone who's active in the church. Yeah. And, and how do we kind of get back to that point and, and where that removal or that disconnect has happened? And I think he really did a great job of saying that. But again, we have to get back to the point, in my opinion, like Gary said, our leaders have to come together now that's right. within the church and figure out a game plan that they can, I hate to say this, but really have to reintroduce themselves mm -hmm. back to the community to be able to go ahead and bridge that, that gap that social media, in my opinion, has now taken a role in and being that voice. You know, they rather look at that and they're more active with that than their sure. church leaders or, or the, the, the leaders in the community. And, uh, and churches are doing that. There are pastors realizing that, you know what, it's time for us to re- visit you know how we approach the community i mean there are people pastors now are realized they have more people they're touching more people now because of covid and if they're doing it the right way through virtual services phone call campaigns things like that they're actually building better deeper relationships with people because they're intentionally having to do it but when you're right. in the building you know you can right. get comfortable and, and and not and have people right there with you and not realize that they're hurting or they're you know, they, they need you. So there are pastors, there are churches realizing the need to relaunch and re, uh, re reimagine how they're approaching ministry. One thing I wanted to mention to what Alicia said about the church being the center, I, I think personally, a lot of the problems we have in the church in the suburban areas is because of suburban crawl. If you go to the country, if you go to a lot of cities, the church still is the center of those communities, especially if you're in the country or you're in areas where the people are densely populated but when you're in Stafford and Fairfax and Manassas and you're spread out in these suburban areas you're right it's definitely a big it can be a big gap because you have the middle class hoity toity type of folks congregating to certain types of ministries where they where they may not have that sort of connection as they do in the country or in the city where the church really is uh the hub of the community right. that yeah. suburban sprawl has definitely uh impacted the church in the suburbs but there are ways to address that too. It just requires, I think, the leaders to come together, as Dame said, and put strategies together where we work together to meet the needs of the community spiritually and not worry about our own brand and our own label. Well said. Well, I think you're right, Gary, because I think that's what that's where I, me personally, I'm feeling it is the suburban um, situation, <laughs> you know, and, and I think that that was um, accurate because I, I feel like uh, even though maybe I wasn't even kind of conscious of that, uh, but I, I feel that to be true. It's just that aspect because when I go home, I, my church is still there. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. Okay. Anyway. So 
I'm just going to go to to the second part of that question then, and and tell me if I'm correct in, in understanding. So you are also a board member of with the NAACP, correct? I am not a board. They don't have boards. I am the uh, well, I'm a chairman of the Economic Development Committee. Okay. Uh, within the NAACP, yeah. So with that, and just reading that, so again, the same question: What role has the NAACP now play in our in the black community? Because again, you know, depending on who you ask, I see you laughing. <laughs> You know, but I thought this would be a great question because a lot of people in our community are really, I don't want to say broke, but we're kind of split down the middle as to what role the NAACP does now play in our community. So I figured I would ask you that. Hey, great question. And and, and look, I, I answer and uh, whatever I say, if it comes back and people get mad at me, I, you know, I won't say what my, my father said. He says it's better to be peed off than peed on. Right. So, <laughs> right. You know, that's, that's, that's what I say to anybody that doesn't like what I'm about to say. <laughs> I've been in Stafford 20 plus years. Um, for the majority of that, I didn't know Stafford had an NAACP branch. Um, last year, with all of the stuff going on, as I was going through my own thoughts about the role of the church in the community, I began to say, where's the NAACP? Where's the, you know, Urban League? Where, where are those organizations that were so vital to helping us get through times like this? Exactly. And they were, in my opinion, were absent as I talked to people. I found the same thing. So I joined. You know, I'm that type of person where I'm not going to sit back and complain. I'm going to roll my sleeves up and I'm going to get involved and try to be the difference that I want to see. So I joined the Stafford branch and became very active in the branch and uh, became uh, the chair of the board. And the NAACP became more active last year, but a lot of it was because of what was going on. You know, and I, and I believe they kind of tagged on to a lot of the activities that were going on. In my opinion, the NAACP can be more progressive mm -hmm. in terms of connecting with the community, mm -hmm. in terms of collaborating with other organizations. There's a lot of hierarchical, bureaucratic, political stuff right. that is amazing to me, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. I mean, in this day and age, for, the, for this sort of an organization to have so many layers of stuff you have to cut through to get simple things done, that's why I think that it hasn't moved as progressively as it ought to, and as I think it will. There's new leadership in the Stafford branch now um, this year, and we'll see if, um, you know, if the new leadership can move the organization to a place of relevance and a place where people really um, go back to appreciating the NAACP. I appreciate that brand. I understand the benefit is provided to our community, to our people, um, but I think we've kind of lost sight of that, um, and I hopefully we can get back to to, to the place where it was. We have branches here, Spotsy and in Fredericksburg. And those three, in my mind, ought to work together more for this region and not be so focused on zip codes. Mm -hmm. um, and I've said this, and we'll see if uh, people just stop answering my call or we put the division <laughs> down and come together and begin to make a difference. Because that's really what it's about. And the bottom line is that it does not matter if we're all moving in the same direction, we need to move in the same direction. Yeah. Now, the way you get there may be different than the way I get there, but we're going, our goal is the same. And I do understand being selective. Like yeah. some things you just don't want to hit your wagon to, you sure. know, some ideologies and some rhetoric is just not um, who you are in the core. And I get that part, but the most majority um, we're all trying for the same thing. Absolutely. We're all striving. So it should not be a situation of zip codes or, uh, <laughs> you know, all of this paperwork and hierarchy and all of these things. It's like, okay, we're all one. We're under this umbrella. Mm -hmm. Let's go this way. We all should be moving in the same direction as a people mm -hmm. to Absolutely. get to where we need to get, um, to you know, where we're going. So. Sure. Well, let me give you an example of two of the things that they're doing that I've been involved with that are helpful. And I'm, this is with the youth council, not with the adults. Um, but today they had a uh, session on human trafficking. And they had a, a lady from Fredericksburg who works in social services, whose daughter was uh, well, was coached up and prepared it's right under her nose. And she knows about sexual violence. She knows about things. She's preached to her daughter to be wary of this and of that. And right under her nose, there was someone preparing her daughter to the point that her daughter was, was taken. Um, and she told her story. And the NAACP youth were brave enough to get her on and to open it up to, to, to whoever wanted to attend to explore yeah. this because human trafficking is real. That's the sort of thing I think they need to take the lead on bringing 
to the forefront, not, not, not golf tournaments, not mother daughter tees. Those are fine, but it's the, it's real out here. And there are tough things happening. And I think those tough things need to be met head on. They're also, I worked with them to coordinate a food distribution event on January 30th through the NAACP youth at a local church. And they're going to be giving away a hundred boxes of prepared non-perishables for free to the first Good. people that come. And these are the young people coming together to do that. So when I see that, I'm encouraged about, about the future of the organization and the value and the relevance it can provide, but we have to keep moving, moving that way. And if we have to start with the young people, then we just start with the young people. Okay. Well, I like, I like the sounds of, of that because that really feeds though into the next case. So the next question that I have is really talking about tangible items and tangible action items. So what do you think, or in your view, how, do, how does, like, how do we as a community make tangible strides to break uh, the chains of social injustice or social inequality? Yeah, yeah the, the number one tangible item that comes to mind is we have to allow, we have to put ourselves in places of authority within our communities. We have to put us, we have to become sheriff. We have to sit on the board of supervisors. We have to be uh, members of the school board. We have to, you know, we have to put ourselves in position where policy is looked at and changed. And until we get there, we have to make ourselves part of those subcommittees and those subgroups that advise them or hold them accountable. And Stafford, as an example, one thing we worked a lot on last year was the formation of a multicultural commission for the Stafford Board of Supervisors. They approved it and they finally selected the initial group of members. And these are people that are gonna bring to the board any issues regarding race across the county, housing, law enforcement, education, whatever it happens to be. And they'll be able to come to the county and, and bring these issues to them, make recommendations on how the county can maybe change policies, et cetera, in dealing with people of color. That commission is huge, I think. And it's gonna grow in its scope and its responsibility and have more teeth over the years. We have to start by getting into positions of authority and influence so we can make changes. We can vote, right? But we also have to make sure people like Alicia can get in some of these seats and people like Kim and, and others that care about the community that have a voice and wanna see fairness for everybody. We have to get in place where we can make those changes. Tangibly, I think that's what needs to happen. And what I see now is a lot of people realize they can run and they can right. win these seats right. and they can become a, a person that can sit on planning commissions and make and have and understand how zoning is done. So we're not setting up zones where our schools are, you know, unfairly populated, right? We have to make sure we're in a seat to make those decisions, number one. And I think out of that, we'll have other metrics that we can manage and monitor to make sure we're moving the ball forward. But I think it has to start with us realizing we need to be those leaders in our community, in our state, and at the national level. Otherwise, we're always going to be going to the king with the plate in our hand, asking them to do it. We need to be on the other side of that, uh, making those decisions ourselves. And we can. We're capable. Very Absolutely. well said. Very well said on that one. Mm -hmm. So at this point in time, uh, we're going to go ahead and take a pause for the cause. We're going to go ahead and let our sponsors jump in, and we'll be right back after the break. Hey, what's happening, listeners? It's your man, Dame DNYDC of the Two Mics Up podcast. And I'm proud to present 94 Media House. 94 Media House is a small black-owned digital design company that takes pride in servicing other small businesses and creators. They help them present the best version of themselves to the world. Take it from me and the Two Mics Up podcast because 94 Media House does all of our branding and marketing. 94 Media House provides branding, graphic design, marketing, and other design services to meet your needs. Hit them up today at 94mediahouse at gmail.com. That's 94mediahouse, all one word, at gmail.com. BeFund Technology provides organizations of all sizes with the best, most trustworthy IT solutions. In the ever-evolving technology market, BeFund Technology believes that companies need reliable allies who can guide them through the challenges that accompany today's technological growth. BeFund Technology, our mission, your vision, our solution. BeFund Technology, call them today. All right, fam, we're back. And we are here today, two mics up, uh, with an amazing guest, Mr. Gary Holland. You know, he is the uh, executive board member in NAACP chapter. He is a associate pastor here in the community. And he is a 
big time, I want to say activist with the Enough Group. Like I've just learned so much today uh, with this brother being on. Um, I'm really excited to continue this conversation. And, you know, with that being said, you know, Gary, in your opinion, this really in your, your deepest opinion, what can we do uh, or what steps can we take to improve, you know, our self-esteem, mm. you know, as a culture? Mm. You know what? I'm, I'm so glad you asked that question because there's two things that I was thinking about during the break that I was hoping we'd be able to, uh, to get to. And that question leads me to, to, to both of those. Um, one thing in particular, I, I believe we can, should do to build our self-esteem, to build our confidence in who we are, what our potential is, is we need to learn how to be more comfortable talking. You know, I, I, I do a lot of work for my company. Before COVID, we would have uh, trade shows and college students would come in, engineering trade shows. And you'd be amazed at how many college students, bright students, wouldn't be able to look you in the eye and talk to you. Say that again. They would look down, they'd mumble, uh, they wouldn't shake your hand firmly, have a conversation. Um, the ability just to speak confidently, you don't have to talk like anybody else. You can talk like you talk, right? But the ability to communicate, the ability to carry yourself as a leader with some authority, with some confidence is very important. And I felt that for a long time, our community is missing that, especially with our kids on phones all the time and Snapchat and all of that sort of thing. They're losing that social connection. As a result, um, last year, I actually started the S3 Toastmasters Club. Okay. All and right. Toastmasters is an international program focused on building leaders and developing communication skills. And we actually formed our club and you need 20 members to charter. We had 25 paid signed up members in the first month. And that's almost wow. unheard of. Wow. And yeah. we're moving forward with that. Um, so it's all about, we come together twice a month and it's very cool via Zoom. And we just, we have a whole structure, but it gives people an opportunity to think on their feet, to prepare short speeches, to learn how to, to correct themselves, to watch others, and to grow as communicators and to grow as leaders. And I think those are the sorts of things we need to do more of. It's not just for them. You right. know, we need to realize that that's for us as well. We just don't often take advantage of programs and opportunities like that. So our Toastmasters Club is really helping a lot of folks, a lot of folks to actually develop their self-esteem and their communication skills. And I, I, I suggest that people look into either ours or some other Toastmasters club. They're all virtual now, but it's S3 Toastmasters. You can find us on Facebook and check us out. You can attend a meeting and just listen. You don't have to do anything. And if you like it, just become a part of the crew. We're about to have our chartering ceremony uh, at the beginning of February at Vernon Green's Executive Conference Center. And we're going to Zoom it for those that don't come. And it's going to be nice. And it's something that we should all be proud of in our community because it is for us at the end right. of the day. Right. Uh, right. Something that builds self-esteem and confidence. Another thing um, that I think we need to focus on to build our confidence in who we are is to understand who we are. And I understand who I am through my faith. Um, so I'm a big proponent of prayer. And 11 years ago, I started the morning hour of prayer. And for 11 years now, it was five days a week until last year. We went six days a week, last, seven days a week last year, but 6 a.m. Eastern. Uh, we're on the phone praying. It's, it's streamed on Facebook and there's a dial-in number and folks share their prayer requests and we just pray. We rotate the prayer leader and it's not a long event. It's nobody's preaching at you. We're just praying and developing our relationship with you know, the person that we place our faith in. And I think that we get to know more about who we are when we connect more with the person that we place our faith in. So prayer is also something I believe we need to do more of and to do it more consistently and with more meaning and impact because that's how we, I believe we really begin to understand our purpose and understand what it is we're here uh, to accomplish. So prayer and building communication and leadership skills I think are vital for us. And we have programs and opportunities available now for anybody that's interested to jump right in. Won't cost you a dime. All right. That's nice. That is nice. Well, that is nice. Um, if you could do one thing to um, improve Black America, just one thing, what would what, what would you do? What would it be? Yeah, you know, and this is and I, as I turn the as I turn the um, I try to turn the, the the scope back, you know, inward for a question like that. It's easy to, to say, you know, they have held us back, you know, Jim Crow and this and that and 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 segregation and and all of that's true. I, mean, I, I understand our history. I understand that we're starting from behind uh, the starting line. I understand that many other races have opportunities for things that we don't have opportunities for, and it makes it, it's unfair for us. I get that. 
Um, but if I could do anything to change our people, our culture, is to find a way for us to come to a place where we can really just love each other and support each other the way I see other cultures supporting each other in terms of being able to work together, to live together, to make sure their communities have their own banks, their own hospitals, their own grocery stores, their own businesses, right? We tend to struggle with looking at each other with that same kind of love and appreciation and respect to the point that we can establish our own economic hubs within our communities to keep our money, to keep our resources, to keep our people together so we can grow together. I don't know how to change that because there's so much division that's been implemented in our race over the 400 years we've been here. But that's the one thing, if I had a magic wand, I would wave that and replace that with a cultural appreciation and, and love and respect for one another so we can work together and, and really right. make progress together. Because there's so much division, even now, in the middle of a time where we should be more united than ever before, there's still division. And uh, that, that's the one thing that I would try to eradicate. And one of the things that we try to do uh, with Enough as well. Oh, yeah, I, I I agree with that. I agree with the um, of course. I mean, you know, you know me, Gary. You've met me before. <laughs> and one thing I preach is unity. You know, we should we should definitely um, let the perceptions go, right? Because yeah. whatever you may perceive of me or her or you or I, how about having a conversation, getting intimate, getting to know somebody? Because your perception is what may hold us because I don't know the answer like you said I don't have the magic ball but I know the one thing that is really making our road more difficult that a, a difficult road that's already been laid out for us but something that we can take hold of ourselves just to make the path a little bit more smoother for us is that we have so many division amongst right. ourselves. We have so many problems with other people that I think that the divisions amongst us is just almost like we should not be here because we got too, we got too big a fish to fry over here. Right. We yeah. don't have the time to be worrying about, um, you know, who's doing what and who's doing this. Stay focused on the goal and yeah. everybody's personal life. Leave that out of it, right? right. <laughs> and just right. Stay focus on the goal. So I kind of agree with you on that. Yeah, that would be mine too. I mean, I've seen, um, you know, believe it or not, I've seen organizations say that they were going to cancel events if organization B's logo wasn't removed from the flyer. It's that deep. And these are all black, you know, African-American organizations working together for an event. But I've seen it get that, come to that level. And when I see stuff like that, you know, it just kind of, it, it breaks my heart. And just like you said, I mean, if we can't just truly, put, and we don't have to agree on everything, but there has to be some things that we, there has to be foundationally some things that we all can agree on and work on together. And it's the same thing that I said in Undivided for the group of pastors. We're not going to agree on everything, you know, but there has to be some core elements that we all hold fast to that we can kind of unite around and drive forward. It's the same in our community. We have to come to a point where we figure that out. Um, we've done a good job and we've made it. And <laughs> but it's been a bump road. <laughs> but we, we can do a lot better. We can do a whole lot better if well, we can unify. I'm, I'm hoping, you know, through this conversation and, and generally what, you know, we do here is really, um, it's not really extending olive branches, but it's really setting expectations yeah. so that other uh, organizations, men and women of color, we can use this to come together. Um, like I said, this platform is really uh, not only about two mics up, but it is about Gary Holland enough and everything that your organization and everything that you're involved in is very critical, in my opinion, and, and Lisa as well, that people understand that diversity can work. Yeah. And we have to, like you, you eloquently said, we, we're trying to create a foundation. And from a foundation, or even when you're planting seeds in a garden, you know, these limbs are going to grow in different directions, but they're always going up towards the sun. And we have to be moving in that one direction. Now, how we get there and the roads we travel may be different, but the foundation, in my opinion, needs to be the same. There's a core uh, that runs through all of that, like you said. And, I, and I'm hoping that people are hearing that. I hope people are seeing that in what we're doing and what you're doing. 
and all the other fine people that we've been blessed to have on our show so far um, are doing the same thing as well. So, you know, with that, you know, I have to ask, with all of those things being said, it got to be days you get tired, bro. It's got to be days, because I know I do. Yeah, and, well, absolutely. And and when you're not motivated, though, I know your wife stays on you, because I look, I know I got one too. <laughs> and man, Lisa, tell you, but my wife gets one. But outside of that, found that solid foundation because that rock holds you and I get it. I hear you and I feel you when you talk about your wife, but there's still day as a man and, uh, and Lisa, excuse me, because I, you know, I'm, oh, okay, I'm excuse gonna me. Mute. I'm going to mute myself. Right, because I'm talking to the brother here now. I'm going to mute myself. You know, we're going to keep it real because these days though, man, look, past excuse what I'm about to say. I, shit, I'm tired. Uh-huh. And I got to figure out what, there has to be something. We all as men have that one thing or those, one or two things, those sparks. That when your wife or that that is not happening, what is it that moves you to continue down that path and, and keep doing what you're doing each and every day? Yeah, it, you know, and my answer, I'm not a deep dude, you know, mm-hmm. and I, I tell people, when I, mean, I speak at church, I tell them I'm not the deepest guy. I'm not going to hoop and holler. You're not going to get that from me, but what you're going to get from me is what I have. Right. That's all I have. The thing, the spark that really keeps me, has kept me in my marriage through all the issues we've had. My wife and I have counseled a lot of people over the years. The thing that's kept us the thing that's kept us as we've raised five children that are also an additional motivator for me, the thing that's kept me when I have felt like not dealing with anybody in any organization because they've gotten on my nerves. And I just said, you know what? I can can just watch, I can watch the Redskins and mind my business, right? It's been my faith. You know, I came from a place where I might, you know, just like a lot of people and you've heard it, you know, we've come from some some times in our Mm -hmm. lives. Mm -hmm. And when I look back over my life and I see what my faith has brought me through and brought me from, you know, that all I have to do is take three minutes to think back to where I was, you know, 26, 30 years ago, I'm 52 now, Mm -hmm. and think of where I am now in terms of my health, not being incarcerated, not having, you know, just all the sorts of things that I don't have uh, because of what that I should have had by all rights based on who I once was, that really is what keeps me going. That keeps me going. I I could look around and feel bad about, people and t- the times and the government and and all of that. My wife may be mad at me. The kids could be disappointing me. But if I stop and I think about what God has brought me through, right, I realize that he's done it for a reason. Right. So I don't, and I, I have no choice but to just pull myself up, throw my shoulders back and keep moving forward. So that's really my motivating factor, brother, is my faith. Right, man, I appreciate you taking the time to share that because I think it's important um, that men, young men, get to hear that from other other kings, you know, that have been down that road. Yeah. Um, you have some life experience and those words really ring true. And I just wanted to give you that opportunity to kind of share that because I think it needs to be heard. Yeah. So random question before we go, because this one is off the wall. Because I know me, I like movies. I don't know if you like movies or not, but I like movies. And, you know, I have my own theme music in my head. Whenever I enter a room, I got my wakatum, 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 wakatum going on. When I walk into a room, so, you know, what movie best exemplifies your life, in your the opinion? The movie that, <laughs> that best exemplifies my life. Uh, my favorite movie of all times. Mm-hmm. I, I'll, I'll answer that first. Okay. My favorite movie of all times is Enter the Dragon. Okay. Bruce Lee. You know, that's, that's, that's Lee me. Roy. You know, come to, no, not, 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 not a. Oh, no, I'm thinking of a dragon dude. Uh, yeah, you're talking yeah. about the last dragon. Yeah, that dude. Yeah, now you're not talking about him. I'm talking about Bruce Lee, Enter the Dragon. See, I'm gotcha. a little bit older yeah. than you now. Yeah. You work, 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 now, we're the, the same age. Okay. I'm, okay. From, I'm, I'm in the hood. I'm thinking of Bruce okay. Leroy. I want to get the Leroy's pizza. I got you. Uh, I got, I got you. you. Yeah, my bad. Okay. <laughs> it's Bruce Lee, right? Because when I think about, and I think about him, and, and, I, and I love his life story. I mean, he's an Asian guy, as we know, mm-hmm. but he got into a lot of trouble. His family sent him to America. But he always had a dream for himself. He didn't know what it was. But he kept pressing and fighting and overcame obstacles. And he became a superstar. Mm-hmm. Now, unfortunately, he didn't, you know, he passed away, uh, you know, suddenly. But he fought through a lot of things and ultimately became a superstar. So when I think about, you know, my, my favorite movie or my theme movie mm-hmm. or my theme music is the music that you hear when Enter the Dragon comes on. That okay. 70s, that kind of <laughs> hokey 70s kind of silly music. Yeah. You know, that's what I think about, you know. But it, his, his, his life... And what he, uh, he meant a lot as I was a kid. I grew up taking martial arts. My stepfather was an instructor and I took martial arts from 11 until 26. And I stopped as an assistant instructor. Um, but that's been a big part of who I was, the discipline. And uh, Bruce Lee was somebody that always kind of inspired me when I was young. 
So when I think about movies and soundtracks and theme songs, I hear that old campy 70s, <laughs> <laughs> 70s music. <laughs> That's what's up, man. I appreciate I appreciate that. This want to lighten it up a little bit before we get on out. You know what I'm saying? So, least anything before we go ahead and, and wrap up with this brother, uh, this amazing episode today? I thought the episode was really good. I mean, this was um, very clarifying, enlightening, um, and uplifting and encouraging because when you come, when you think about um, reinventing the church and how we're coming back to that, and you know, we're getting back to the foundation and then just uh, moving in the right direction as a whole, as a people, you know, and letting the younger generation of the NAACP let us older people who have our opinions go sit down and have several seats and watch them work and change, change the way the dynamics is going to go. So it was a very broad um, topic. You did a great job, Gary. It was wonderful having you here. Um, mm -hmm. So please know you're part of the Two Mike family. And we'd love to have you again. All right. Hey, well, look, thank you all for, for letting me be on. This has been this has been great. You guys make it easy just to talk, I tell you. <laughs> the way you ask questions and the way you move it, you make it comfortable, you make it easy. One thing that I'll say at the end here is um, I always believe in pressing forward, you know, and no matter how tough the road gets, you know, there's a scripture that says, you know, we got to, you know, don't get tired in doing the right things. Don't become weary in well-doing. I know you guys have those tired days, too. Um, around two mics up and you wonder why you're doing it. So I encourage you to keep on doing the right things because at the end of that scripture, it says you'll reap a harvest if you don't faint. And I hold on to that scripture a lot because I get tired like everybody, but I believe that what I'm doing is the right thing. So I'm determined to keep on pressing through obstacles because I believe that the benefit may not be for me, maybe for somebody else, but that's fine, right? But I'm not going to give up. I'm going to keep on pressing. I encourage you guys to keep doing the same with two mics up, keep reaching people and uh, changing people's lives and touching people's lives uh, with this platform that you have. So thank you so much. We, we will do our best to uh, continue. Um, and I will be remiss if I did not ask you and allow you to take some time. Please let our listeners know where they can get in touch with you, they can follow you, and anything that you have coming up in the community uh, that you'd like to share, please go ahead and do so. You know, take some time. Got it. And as you kind of know, I'm you know jack of a lot of trades and master of none. There are a lot of ways to contact me. The best way to contact me is just on my Facebook page. Uh, is Gary1968. If you if you look for Gary1968, you'll find my Facebook page. Anything that I post or share for enough for Toastmasters for um, NAACP or any other thing, you'll find there. And then from there, you can kind of branch out to where you, you feel most comfortable. But Gary1968 on Facebook is the best way to contact me. That's what's up. So you heard it here, family. Also, check us out next week. We'll be back with another brand new episode. We're going to be sitting down having a discussion with the king. We have a young, amazing actor, Travis Rayborn, who will be here joining us. You don't want to miss it. Uh, going to be a great conversation. And like we always do, you can follow Two Mics Up online at www.twomicsup.com. Also on social media, uh, Two Mics Up on IG, Facebook, and Twitter. And like we always do at this time, stay safe, stay blessed. Mics out. Mics out. What's happening, listeners? It's your man, Dame DNYDC, host of the Two Mics Up podcast. If you know of any small black businesses, or anyone who's out here working hard to educate, empower, and positively impact our communities, we want to hear from you or from them today. Please go to www.twomicsup.com forward slash contact, drop us a line so we can go ahead and connect to try to work to bring your story to our community. At the end of the day, it's going brick by brick, block by block, community by community to stand as one. As always, stay safe, stay blessed. Mike's out.